In this second lecture about the reptiles of Africa, we're going to start off by talking about the diapsid reptiles. Now, the diapsid reptiles, if you remember from yesterday, were the reptiles that have got paired openings on the side of their skull behind their eye. Now, the great archosaur radiation um, left us with the crocodiles, the dinosaurs, and the birds. We also saw a, another radiation known as the Lepidosaurin radiation, and there are several extinct groups within that, but the Lepidosaurus over here that were there also gave rise to the squamate reptiles. So, one of the key and most famous uh, of the reptiles in uh, this group, the diapsid reptiles, are the crocodiles or the crocodilia. These reptiles produce eggs, but as some of you may have seen, they have advanced parental care where the female will look after her, not only look after and guard her nest, but will look after her um, babies, her young when they are born, often traveling with her in her mouth as she travels through uh, the water. Now, another very interesting reptile within this group is known as the tuatara, and this is a what a lot of scientists think is either a sister group to the squamates, so the lizards and the snakes, or part of the squamata itself, um, and a sister group to the lizards. Now, this is a very interesting reptile because it's a uh, skeleton looks a lot like its Triassic ancestors. And interestingly, it's only recorded and found in Madagascar. So, oh, sorry, not Madagascar, in New Zealand. So this is, this is New Zealand, and the Tuatara is found down in that part of the world. So those are two nice examples of diapsid reptiles. If we move on now to the squamata, these are also diapsids in terms of their skull shape, but it's very highly modified. Now, these reptiles have what we call hemipenes. Now, these are paired copulatory organs that are found in the males, um, and they are very important. They are often used to classify these reptiles to species, and they are very important in the overall um, not only the overall identification, but obviously also in uh, the taxonomy of these species. Now, what we've seen in, in several of the groups is that independently, so on their own, they have lost their limbs. And we're going to see several examples of those. Now, within the squamata, we have those that are oviparous, those that are ovoviparous, and also those that are vi viviparous. Now, you need to remember what each of these terms means, all right? So, I'd encourage you to go out and make sure that you can de define oviparous, ovoviparous, and viviparous. One of the key groups uh, in the squamata is the amphisbenids. Uh, these are what are commonly known as the legless lizards. They are oviparous or ovoviparous. Um, generally, they are burrowers. Uh, that have lost their, their limbs, and they have two rings per vertebral, per, per vertebra, excuse me. And often some of them, sorry, have this hardened cap on their heads, which aids in their burrowing. Very importantly, a key feature of this group is that their right lung is either completely lost or significantly reduced. So that is a diagnostic feature. The lizards are another key group amongst the, uh, well, within the squamata, and there are at least, or suspected to be at least, 800 Afrotropical, so species that occur in Africa and in the tropical parts of Africa in particular. And we see at least two endemic families, and there are a couple of examples of the lizards, a more heavily plated lizard, and then one of the more um, smoother scaled lizards. Within the lizards, we have the geckos. Geckos are oviparous, uh, tend to be quite vocal. Uh, the ones in the Kalahari Desert are known as barking geckos, and it's uh, actually really, really interesting 
to hear them early in the evening where they will um, start calling and it's quite an interesting serenade in uh, in the early evening. So they are quite a vocal species, but the really the interesting part of these these reptiles is that they have these toe pads as you can see here that have got really cool structures that's a that's a um, scanning electron microscope image of a particular toe pad which allows them to grip onto very smooth surfaces like uh, walls and on ceilings you often see them running around along the, the ceilings of houses geckos are found all over the world and it's a very large family with over 900 species the skinks are another group uh, within the squamata. They are actually really cool because they are either they can either be oviparous, oviviparous, or viparous. And a really interesting feature about this group is that they have what is called tail autotomy, where they have the ability to um, drop their tails when they are feeling like they're under pressure from a predator. So sometimes people will try and catch them, and as they grab the tail, They'll drop their tail, um, and the whole idea is that when it comes to a predator, the tail comes off and the predator um, takes the tail away but leaves the skink itself alone. Some skinks are legless, like this example over here, also found worldwide, and it's one of the largest um, squamate families, around about 1,500 species, which is really cool. Other lizards are the lacerted lizards. Um, they, are, they are often found in sandy habitats, using their tails and their very um, long toes to run through the habitat. And the agamas, cool examples, are tree and rock agamas that we get around uh, this part of the world. Both of them are oviparous, both uh, groups, the lacerted lizards and the agamas, oviparous. And then also sexually dimorphic, where the males tend to be much more brightly colored than the females. And those of you who have seen tree agamas on some of the acacia trees around this part of the world will know exactly what I'm talking about. The females are much duller, whereas the males can be quite brightly colored, like uh, this example over here. Also within the squamates are the varanid lizards. Uh, these are things known as, these are the lizards, excuse me, that are... Uh, Colloquially called um, the Legavans, and we have a Nile monitor, or Legavan over there, and a rock monitor. They all oviparous, they're predators. Some people believe that, in terms of the Varanids, the uh, Komodo dragon is an example. They may, in fact, have the ability to have venom when they bite you. Uh, this is something that's still being looked at by scientists but they certainly are species that you don't really want uh, to bite, bite you because once they get hold of you, they are not uh, going to let go very quickly. Uh, large, some can get up to 3 meters, 75 kilograms, which is as much as a human. The chameleons are also part of the squamate family. Uh, they are really interesting reptiles in that they have independently movable eyes, so their eyes can move independently, they're oviparous or oviviparous. They have a very cool prehensile tail, which you can see over here, that curls around leaves and allows them to travel around through the foliage. They're also able to change color, as you can see here, this chameleon um, is a lot duller than this one over here. They've got chromatophores within uh, their skin cells, which allows them to change color and blend in with their environment, which is a really cool adaptation. The cordylids and uh, large plated lizards, the gerasaurids, um, are ovoviparous. So this is a, an example of a cordylid lizard, which has got very large spikes, and it tends to, this species particularly, tends to bite its tail and form a round ball. Very interesting story behind uh, this species, we're not going to go into it in this lecture, but they have this as a protective mechanism. Large plated lizards, we have some that have uh, almost lost their limbs. These are species that occur in grassland habitats. This large plated lizard often occurs in, um, in rocky habitats. It's oviparous and endemic uh, to Africa. You only find these species 
in Africa. But probably the most famous uh, group within the squamates are the snakes, the ophidia. These squamates do not have legs, they have a forked tongue, as you can see there. There are approximately 475 Afrotropical species that's within Africa. There aren't any endemic families, so snakes are found the world over, not just in Africa. All right, and just to give you a little bit of perspective, in Colombia and South America, there are about 301 species compared to the 475 in Africa. And then in Indonesia, which is much smaller than Africa, there are 333 species. So if we have a look at some of the individual groups within the squamates, we have species or a group that is uh, probably quite well known to you as students living in Mpumalanga, the pythons, African rock python, which is a constrictor, gets quite large. Um, females can get up to four or five meters long. The oviparous, but the females actually incubate their eggs like this, where they shiver to keep the eggs warm, to, to try and regulate temperature as much as they can. Um, and then pythons are interesting in that they have these vestigial limbs right on um, the ends of their underside. So they have these vestigial, so vestigial means that they are um, just about gone, but still can be seen, um, which is a diagnostic characteristic. In fact, female rock pythons are known to actively defend their young when they are looking after them. So much like crocodiles, they look after their young once they have hatched. We also have another group. They're also uh, the group called the boas. They're primary, primarily found within Indonesia, Malaysia, that part of that part of the world. They're also constrictors, uh, but they are ovoviparous, and the eggs are retained but laid in one of the African species. So these are another group of constricting species. So they're not venomous, but they are constricting. They constrict their prey. Their prey, sorry, not their prey. Then we have the burrowing snakes, and a couple of examples that you uh, can find here in Africa. This is an interesting species over here, Actractaspis. This species has got a side-facing fang, so it's a very difficult species to pick up. If you try and pick it up, you've got to be extremely careful because the fang sticks out on the side, and if you grab it incorrectly, it can very easily jab that fang into you. But many of these, and it's, it's got a side-facing fang because its prey are often found down burrows where it hangs out and it has to enable, it has to jab to the side rather than forwards to be able to uh, grab its prey. So that's another group of, of snakes that you may come across. Some of the more famous venomous snakes or some of the front fanged snakes, the vipers, it has a gaboon adder, a puff adder down here, and then a sidewinder. These are these snakes can be oviparous, ovoviparous, but a key feature is that they have movable front fangs, and their venom is generally cytotoxic, and they are ambush predators, often called sluggish snakes, where they'll sit and wait for their prey to come past, and then strike out at them with their cytotoxic um, venom and then actually follow their prey using their forked tongue and their Jacobson's organ, which is found uh, in, within their skulls, to track the species so they can find their prey. So the prey is often bitten, then runs off, but the snake is able, using its, its forked tongue, to track where the animal ran off to and then find it again. Speaking of venom, snake venom is very, very interesting. Many of the venoms that, uh, many of the, much of the venom that is produced by snakes damages cells, that's the cytotoxic venom, can interfere with the nervous system, that's neurotoxic venom, can prevent blood clotting, which is um, the hemotoxic venom, um, and can also promote the spread of toxins in some cases. Now, the clinical effects on people are what you see here, they can damage cells, jam the nervous system, prevent blood toxins, uh, prevent blood from clotting. And generally speaking, amongst the snakes, we find that the cobras are neurotoxic, so they influence the nervous system. 
The adders or the vipers tend to be cytotoxic, so they damage cells and break cells up. And then you have hemorrhagic or hemotoxic venom, and that's in snakes like the worm slung, the tree snake, which prevents the blood from clotting. So it's important to know that snakes, different snakes produce different types of venom. And when you go into hospital, it's often important, if you've been bitten by a snake, to make sure that you understand which species bit you. Uh, but doctors can also generally um, figure out which group of snake bit you. And you don't have to know the actual species, but you need to know what symptoms it is calling, causing sorry, so that you can actually get the treatment that you need. The polyvalent antivenom is often what would be um, dished out in particular cases. Another group of uh, front fang snakes are the lapids or the cobras. The um, black mamba is also found in this group. They can be oviparous, oviparous. They do not have movable fangs, but fixed fangs. The venom tends to be neurotoxic. They're often active hunters and active during the day, and that's why they're seen by people and, and often spear, uh, feared by people. Some of the cobras, like the Mozambican spitting cobra, we get around this part of the world, spits in defense. The runkos um, is another one that does that. This is a cape cobra over here. Some of the most venomous snakes, but also sometimes the most nervous snakes, and that's why people tend to fear them. We also have sea snakes around South Africa. These are, are mostly pelagic, that, um, well, some are pelagic and never come ashore. Um, but they've got some really cool cutaneous respiration, which allows them to hang out in the ocean and not come ashore. And they are ovoviparous. You do also get some species that come ashore. So they spend some time ashore, uh, but these are mostly the Asian species. These are highly venomous snakes, but people generally do not come into contact um, with sea snakes terribly often. Another group are the colubrids. This is a group that um, the worm slung, here's an example of it over here, as well as the egg eater and some other species have been grouped into. The taxonomists tend to call them a dumping ground because whenever they're unsure of a snake's taxonomy or classification, they tend to class it as a colubrid snake. Now the colubrids, some of them are venomous, many are not. Uh, they tend to be back fanged snakes. Um, some of them are constrictors, so they constrict their, their, their prey and they don't have venom. But then you get others that are specialists like the egg eater. Very, very specialized snake that um, will only uh, eat eggs and eggs of particular species. So just to end off, just to have a look at some really cool South African snakes that are really restricted to parts of South Africa, some endemic snakes. The first one is the Berg Adder, picture of it over here, only found in very restricted habitats, mountainous habitats down in the western, eastern Cape, around Lesotho, and then along the escarpment here in Mpumalanga. So we get, we get um, this has got a restricted distribution, important um, reptile species, snake species in South Africa. It's an endemic, not very common. And you compare that to something else like the puff adder, which is a very common species found all over South Africa based on this distribution map. All right. Uh, and it is a very, very common ambush predator across much of South Africa. It's also um, one of the species that tends to bite people uh, more often than, than some others. And that's mainly because of its cosmopolitan distribution, but also because it is found in um, ambush positions waiting for prey. And sometimes it, people will stand on it because it is very slow to move out of the way. And the final species is the gaboon adder with a highly restricted distribution, basically only in the subtropical forests of KwaZulu-Natal. So there we have some examples of the major reptile groups of Africa, Southern Africa. Some of these are very important with restricted distributions, but also have some important implications for people.